Good evening. My name is Carrie, and I get to work with Young Adult Ministry, specifically the Women's Ministry Coordinator, I think is my title. Uh, and I daily get to learn from you, and I daily get to see Jesus in you, and I grow closer to Jesus because of you. So as David stands up here and says, we hope that this is an environment where that happens, I get to experience that from you, and it is a humbling gift to get to share the word of God to you because I love and admire and respect you so very much. We're going to start out with a little bit of fun because... It's kind, of a, it's kind of a serious topic, right? There's a lot of like, there's a lot of weighty things around marriage and dating and all of those things. And as I was thinking about what do I want to talk about, and not just what do I want to talk about, but what does God want to share and what do I need to hear around marriage, what came up is this idea of what marriage isn't. Because I could stand up here with my husband and you could ask us questions and we could tell you all about the great things that our marriage is. And there are a lot of those, right? But so often we do this weird thing where we put marriage and dating and relationships on this pedestal and y'all, we make it an idol. So tonight we're talking about marriage as idolatry because marriage is not God. Marriage is not salvation. Marriage is not our purpose or our identity. That's it, that's a message, you can go home. <laughs> <laughs> right? So as I'm thinking through that, these quotes start coming to mind from movies. These movie quotes pop into my head, and then I start thinking, no wonder, no wonder we're so screwed up, y'all. Some of these quotes, like, you have bewitched me, body and soul. If you got that on a note under your doorstep, you would call that stalking, right? <laughs> it's like nigh on to obsession, some of these things, right? I hope you got this picture of what our culture and our world thinks about love. It's very self-focused. It's very caught up in this kind of mutual obsession a little bit, right? As I thought about this week's message, I had to really spend a lot of time with the Lord on this one because I know that it comes with a lot of hurt. I know that because I've seen it in your eyes and I've heard it in your stories of broken hearts. And the concept of relationships and marriage, there's so many emotions that come with it, right? There's jealousy and confusion and joy and thrill and celebration and sadness, and grief, and so much pain. And we all show up here tonight with this tapestry of these emotions all woven together because we have different experiences in relationships. And I've asked the Lord many times, <laughs> am I the person to share this message? Because I got married when I was 21. And I had a kid when I was 22. And my question every time I stand up here is, can I relate? Can I relate to the questions that my friends are asking around marriage when my circumstances might look different? And the Lord in his kindness reminded me, hey Gary, preach to yourself, right? Because I'm learning so much around this concept of relational idolatry right now. And here's the deal, I love my husband. Or at least I'm learning to love him well. He loves me much better than I love him. I puked on my shoes last week. True story, I'm not pregnant. But I puked on my shoes last week, and Caleb takes my shoes off, and he gives me his water, and he tucks me in, and he takes the kids so that I can rest and recover in peace. That's real life romance, as we call it, at our house, right? If you don't know him, you should, because he is kind, and he's patient, and he's gentle, and he's self-sacrificing, and he sees people. He sees people, all things I didn't even know to pray for. But here's the thing. Can I tell you a secret about marriage? I'm still lonely sometimes. I'm still lonely a lot of the time. Caleb and I look at each other just two weeks ago. I remember we just look at each other with this look on our faces that we both know that just says, I wish, I wish I could take your pain away. I wish I could be everything that you needed me to be, but I can't. I'm in a thin, place tonight. I don't know if you can tell. Um, it's been a, a long week. It's been a long season. It's been a long year. And I am married, but I can speak to the desire for a relationship 
that I don't have. For me, it's a relationship at this point that I will never have. And the questions that come with that, and the hurt, hurt and the ache that come with it. My dad died in January of last year, which ended this hope for the redemption of our relationship that I was holding on to really tightly. He was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder when I was a baby, and so that is all I ever knew of him. And I knew that he wanted to be a good dad. I knew that. But he couldn't, <laughs> and he wasn't. And I was left with all of these questions. <laughs> What's wrong with me that I don't get a dad? What did I do to deserve that? How can I fix something in me to be enough? How can I fix him? How can I make our relationship what I need? Because it is a need, and I would be as bold to say it is an unmet need. I go to a coffee shop sometimes, and a dad and daughter will walk in, and they'll sit down, and they'll just talk. And I said, I have to leave, <laughs> to get up and walk out so that I don't burst into tears because I'm jealous. And I'm angry. I don't even know her, and I don't like her. <laughs> right? Because I have this longing and this, this deep desire. Do you see where I'm going here? We have these deep desires for relationship. We were created for relationship. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created us as a part of this whole dynamic of interconnected pieces relationally, and it was whole, and it was good, and he calls it shalom, which means peace. And then it broke. It broke at the fall, and when it broke, we broke too. And last semester, we talked a lot about our internal brokenness, but the other thing, or another thing that broke, is our relational wholeness. Relationships with one another in community, in families, in marriage. That broke, too. And so we start looking for ways to heal our broken relational wholeness. And in this season of life, in this stage, it often feels like marriage is the answer to broken shalom. You complete me. I don't know where that comes from, right? I'm broken, maybe you can fix me. He can, he's tried. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see how this goes sideways? Unmet desire for relational wholeness is a tricky thing because especially in a consumer culture, if we are not very mindful about our motivation for entering into relationships, we will expect someone else to be our answer. We will use them like we might, like dry shampoo, right? Like, I have a problem, I don't wanna wash my hair, yeah? And Instagram somehow knows this about me. And so this ad pops up and it's like dry shampoo! Solves all your problems and so I click on it and I buy it and I use it and all of a sudden, no one knows I haven't washed my hair in three days, right? We do that. If we are not careful, we will turn people into products to solve our problems. If we are not careful, we will build transactional relationships that turn people into things that they were never meant to be. People made in the image of God who were not made to be your God. Do you get the difference? There's a book called Reaching Out by Henry Nouwen, I read it in college, I would very much recommend it if this is something you're struggling with. What do I do with my loneliness? I don't wanna put it on someone else, so what do I do with it? He says in that book, no friend or lover, no husband or wife, no community or commune will be able to put to rest our deepest cravings for unity and wholeness. Friendship and love cannot develop in the form of an anxious clinging to each other. It is sad to see how sometimes people suffering from loneliness search for a final solution for their pain and look at a new friend, a new lover, or a new community with messianic expectations. In other words, be my savior. Friends, that's idolatry. Some of you have made an idol out of someone you haven't even met yet. That's a lot of pressure. 
some of you have made an idol out of someone who is not pointing you to Jesus and not loving you like Jesus, and it's blurring your ability to see it. Some of us (laughs) have made an idol out of what we wish someone could be. And I know, I know that uncovering those idols feels like a sock in the gut. It's a little hard to breathe. But lean into that. Pay attention to that because that means that there is healing to be had tonight. If we recognize a tendency in ourselves to make idols out of people, and I think we all do it to some degree, it is the furthest thing from love. It is only self-seeking. It is not loving people well. It is too much for a human person to carry divine expectations. So what do we do about it? We have to be really honest with ourselves, with our desires. What is behind that idol that we're missing? We have to let our picture of marriage shift because marriage isn't salvation. Here's an illustration of that. A couple of the main players in the New Testament, Paul, not married. Jesus, not married. Main players in the Old Testament, Abraham, David, Solomon, married way too much. Right? Like, lots and lots of wives. (laughs) And what that says to me is there's not a plug-and-play formula of what our life circumstances need to be in order for us to take part in the kingdom. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians, I wish that all were as I myself am, meaning not married. But each has a particular gift from God, one having one kind and another a different kind. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is well for them to remain unmarried as I am. In other words, I prefer not being married, right? And I prefer that for you too because I've seen the fruit of it in my life. But you might have a different gift. You might have the gift of marriage, and that's okay too. Essentially, one is not better than the other. And we know this because in Ephesians 5, Paul speaks of marriage as this beautiful picture of the gospel. And it is. Marriage, when it is centered on the kind of love that Jesus exhibits, is a beautiful picture of the gospel. But you know what else is a beautiful picture of the gospel? The church. This right here is a beautiful picture, a living, breathing picture of the gospel in action that you are taking part in right now. Do you know what you don't have to be to take part in that picture of the gospel? Married, right? If this is a painful topic for you, as it is for me, whether that's a desire for marriage or a relationship with a mom or a dad or a friend or a sibling that you don't have that you so desperately long for, I want to invite you into Isaiah 43. And yes, that is intentional, invite you into Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43 is a passage, essentially God is showing up and he is saying, I am this, I am this, I am this, I am this. Why have you turned your back on me? Why do you choose other things? I've given you all of this. Because he's saying to his people who at the time had chosen idols, had chosen other things instead of God. In Isaiah 43, God is heartbroken. He's heartbroken for us, for his people. He's talking to the Israelites, but it's his chosen people that we get to be part of now. And when I read you in this passage, don't just think you individual you, right? This is a collective that God is talking to. It's ustedes, it's y'all, right? (laughs) When you read you in the Bible, it's a collectivist culture. Almost always, almost always it means you all. Y'all is the language of the Bible. It's a pronoun of the Bible and of the church, right? Y'all. So hear that as I read to you. And if you want to, close your eyes and just listen. This is from the message just because it's so poetic and lovely. And see if God has a word or a phrase for you here. But now, God's message, the God who made you in the first place, Jacob, the one who got you started, Israel, do not be afraid. I have redeemed you. I have called your name. You are mine. 
When you are in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you are between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Because I am God, your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Savior. I paid a huge price for you. All of Egypt with rich Cush and Seba thrown in. That is how much you mean to me. That is how much I love you. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. Trade the creation just for you. So do not be afraid. I am with you. I will round up all your scattered children, pull them in from east and west. I'll send orders north and south, send them back. Return my sons from distant lands, my daughters from faraway places. I want them back. Every last one who bears my name, every man, woman, and child whom I created for my glory, yes, personally formed and made each one. Get the blind and deaf out here and ready. The blind, though there is nothing wrong with their eyes, and the deaf, though there is nothing wrong with their ears. Then get the other nations out here and ready. Let's see what they have to say. Let them present their expert witnesses and make their case. But you are my witnesses, God decrees. You are my hand-picked servant, so that you will come to know and trust me, understand both that I am and who I am. Previous to me, there was no such thing as a God, nor will there be after me. I, yes, I am God. I am the only Savior there is. I spoke, I saved, I told you what existed long before these upstart gods appeared on the scene. And you know it. You are my witnesses. You are the evidence. Yes, I am God. I have always been God, and I will always be God. No one can take anything from me. I make who can unmake it. God, your Redeemer, the Holy of Israel says, just for you, I will march on Babylon. I'll turn the tables on the Babylonians. They will be wailing. I am God, your Holy One, creator of Israel, your King. This is what God says. The God who builds a road right through the ocean, who carves a path through pounding waves, the God who summons horses and chariots and armies, they lie down and then can't get up. They're snuffed out like so many candles. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert, be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It is bursting out, don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert, rivers in the badlands. Wild animals will say thank you. The coyotes and the buzzards, because I provided water in the desert, rivers through the sun-baked earth, drinking water for the people I chose, the people I made especially for myself, a people custom built to praise me. But you didn't pay a bit of attention to me, Jacob. You so quickly tired of me, Israel. It wasn't that I asked that much from you, but you didn't even do the minimum. So stingy with me, so close-fisted, but you haven't been stingy with your sins. You've been plenty generous with them, and I'm fed up. But, but I, yes, I am the one who takes care of your sins. That is what I do. I do not keep a list of your sins. I think that means both the ways that we hurt other people and the ways that we have been sinned against in relationships because we all have both. I love this passage so much because God is saying here, this is what I am doing for you. Beside me, there is no savior. God, the one who made you, the one who has called your name, the one who redeemed you, the one you belong to, the one who is right next to you when you are in over your head, the one who is God, the one who paid a huge price for you, the one who created you for his glory, the one who personally formed and made each one of you, the one who hand-picked you, the one who is the only savior there is. Any person that you hope might fulfill you seems pretty small right now, huh? This is not a guilt trip. This is not a do your devotions and your God will bring you your husband or wife, right? 
I cannot promise you that the human relationships that you so long for and so desire will turn out how you had hoped. I, w I wish I could. I wish I could promise that. But Jesus does say, come to me all who are weary. Jesus does say, I will give you the desires of your heart. And he is not promising marriage there. He is promising himself. We elevate marriage to this position of purpose and identity. But according to Isaiah 43, who were God's people made for? God himself. And what were God's people made to do? Custom made to do? Praise God. Just like that. Right? And if those things sound boring or abstract or lackluster to you, can I say with all the kindness in the world, you might not know God very well yet. I would encourage you to know God and not just know more about God, but learn to actually know and experience God. That is something that we are called to do together. And I just want to give you a picture of what this has looked like for me, even just this week. I got to do a, it's called Lexio Divina. It means uh, divine reading. And it's just a way of listening to scripture in order to hear what God might have for you in that word. And this was the passage that came up, this Isaiah 43 passage. And we listened to verses 16 through 21. And as you're doing Lexio Divina, the goal is to listen for a word that just stands out to you or a phrase. And the word that stood out to me was pounding. I've been dealing with migraines a lot the last few weeks, and I think it stood out because I can feel the pounding of that pain in my head, and I can experience the pounding of the waves in life, right? Those things that just flat knock you over, and the second you get back up, you're down again. The pounding of the waves in that rhythmic experience of how do I keep doing this? How do I keep doing this, God? I don't know. And we listen again, and the words that stand out to me this time are the end of that passage, the people I made especially for myself. And what's so cool about scripture is that often scripture inspires other scripture, and so this picture in my head is from John 1.18, thinking about God drawing people to himself. And in John 1.18, it says that Jesus is near to the Father's heart. And if I'm with Jesus, if I follow Jesus, I am near to the Father's heart too. And so it was like God was taking me and pulling me close to his heart. You know what we hear when we're close to the Father's heart? The pounding changes. It's no longer the pounding waves of life. It is the beating heart of my Father. And that changes things. That changes things. When I'm there, I don't want anything else. Close to the Father's heart, I don't focus on the pounding waves. I hear, I feel the pounding of my Father's heart, and I can live in rhythm to its beat. The more I spend time knowing and experiencing God, the more I can tangibly feel and experience him. And I can only explain that to you in intangible words. So we've got to do this together in community. Know God more. And we've got to do it because we, then we can go out and we can pull others into that embrace of God and we can collectively live to the rhythm of the beating heart of our Father. People are looking for the relational wholeness found in Jesus and the community of the church. You, even if you don't know it, are looking for relational wholeness found in Jesus and the community found in the church. But we look in all of these places that don't and can't satisfy. I think we need to answer the question for ourselves. What do we desire more? The good gifts or the giver of the good gifts? I don't want you to walk away from this message feeling guilty about making idols. I make idols out of strange father-daughter duos at coffee shops. <laughs> is that weird? Yeah. But is it human? Absolutely. I want you to walk away from this message having been drawn near to the heart of God. 
Because at the end of the day, that is what we are all looking for. That is what we desire. It's what we crave. It is what satisfies. So let's practice together being there first. And then trust and let the rest come as it will. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I thank you that you are good that you are better, that you are more, that you are best, that you are what we are looking for and that you have made yourself known, that you do not hide, that we can find you and we spend all of this time looking in places for things that we could already have if we would just look up at your face. God, I pray that whatever things, whether it's a desire for marriage or a relationship that we don't have, whatever it is that is filling this place in our heart, in our mind, where we can no longer hear your heartbeat, God, I pray whatever that is, that we would open our hands and we would let it go. And we would trust. And we would be drawn near to your heart. And that we would find there the thing that we are really looking for. And that we would point each other to you. That we would walk together as a collective whole of y'alls knowing you more. Being reminded that we are together so we are not alone. That you are with us so we are not alone. God, we want you more. I pray that that would be the living reality of our daily life. That we would live to the rhythm of your beating heart. Amen. Amen.